It's a new year on Supercars Talk and kicking it off, I've got a very special interview with one of the sport's favourite unsung heroes, Jack Perkins. Welcome to 2024 and kicking it off this year we've got a very special episode. I got to interview Jack Perkins just before Christmas. Now this was done very early one morning while we were very busy heading into the festive period um, but don't hold that against us. I think it was a great interview so here I am interviewing Jack Perkins. On this very special episode of Supercars Talk I've got one of my uh, favourite drivers ever sons to talk to. Um, Jack, w without, you know, bullshitting to you or anything, um, you've definitely been one of my favourite drivers over the years as well, uh, probably because uh, I respected your father and that so much um, and then just followed you all the way through. But uh, welcome to the show. Yeah, when you were saying oh, at the start, your favourite driver, I thought you were going to say me and I'm thinking, crikey. Um, and then you said <laughs> dad, which is all all good. But uh, no, thanks for in inviting me along. And um, yeah, obviously, you know, my old man was my favourite driver as well, so mm. we share that in common. Yeah, there, there was always even, um, like, my father was a very much a Ford man, uh, but he always had a soft spot for Larry Perkins as well. Um, and then I, I just kind of followed that on. Uh, and, yeah, then you came along, so I followed your career all the way through as well. Yeah, it's funny, um, you know, interacting quite a lot with all the old Perkins fans with my own sort of business now if you like and there's so many people that do write to me whether it's on my youtube channel or on facebook or whatever and they say exactly that you know we're ford fans but we we love larry and obviously that's pretty cool but i think at the end of the day you know dad's values kind of resonate pretty well with australians you know made in australia do do it your way and um you know as a ford fan it's probably hard to not resonate with some of the key values that was you know that made up my old man he's a larrikin and um yeah, you know he's been it. very successful so i think i think that's probably why it counts and i mean it's probably the same for dick johnson the other way around tr tr to be honest but um you know i think it, it sometimes gets lost a little bit with with one-eyed ford or holden supporters <laughs> that you got to hate someone and love the others or vice versa so no nah, yeah. it's, it's obviously pretty cool when when ford people can still acknowledge you for who you are and what you've done well you you've done a bit of both over the years as well haven't you yeah, it's funny. Like, I mean, obviously, I grew up um, with a lot of Holden influence, and 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 it was probably what I really wanted to be involved with was the Holden racing team. But it doesn't always work that way, and you kind of always got to pick and choose the best opportunities. And hmm. you know, I've always had a little bit of a saying that you, you can't really see the badge from the steering wheel. So sometimes, <laughs> um, whilst pa for, you know, fans are fairly passionate. Um, when you're in the heat of the moment and you're driving the race car, you, you don't really have any sort of spare concentration to think about what badges on the front of the thing and you just get on with your, with your job. But obviously, um, yeah, I've had sort of a bit of a run with both brands over the years. I, I never dabbled in the Nissan or the Volvo or the Mercedes, um, mm. although I did get to drive the Merc as part of my role with, with Erebus the last couple of years. But yeah, I only really okay. ever raced predominantly Holdens and, and then a little bit of Ford stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, just a, a bit more about what you're doing now. Um, you're not one of these just latte sipping drivers, obviously. You've got a lot of work going on in the background. Um, just wondering a bit more what's involved in all that, because you do keep yourself busy basically full time between TV, driving and everything else. Yeah, I mean, um, to be completely honest, you know, motor racing as a driver hasn't been as kind as I would love to, to have been from a financial point of view. Um, I've never been that kind of full-time race car driver on a on a big salary and, and kind of, you know, get to travel around chasing girls and all that sort of stuff. Um, I've always had to sort of work, work during the week. Um, and, you know, my parents sort of reiterated that to me when I was quite young, because if the driving thing didn't work out, you kind of always needed to have a bit of a backup option. And I've kind of always worked um, in different roles. I mean, when I finished school, I started university and I didn't really enjoy that. And then I got straight into work and I've worked at <clears throat> in different levels of dad's race team. And then I ended up becoming a sign rider and I moved to Queensland. I worked for Paul Morris and then I came back to 
um, Melbourne in 2012 when sort of dad had really sold the business right over to the Kelly brothers and Kelly Racing. And dad wanted a, a hand to move out of the, 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 the factories that Perkins Engineering was based in so that he could kind of retire properly. So I started helping him do that, but then realized there was quite a lot of Perkins Engineering kind of car owners and customers that were a little disappointed that if the business was closing down, what were they going to do with their old cars and who could they speak to for advice? And I started integrating with a few of the car owners and the customers and basically started pulling stuff out of the rubbish bin that dad was getting rid of and kind of... Um, I guess kick-started or restarted Perkins Engineering, which I'm wearing one of my work jumpers here, uh, where we just started to work on a few of the old cars. The first car I worked on was a 97 Bathurst winner. Um, a, a really good friend now uh, came to me with that car. He just purchased it and said, can you have a bit of a look over it? And, you know, I'd only ever seen that car as a, as a restored car doing bits and pieces. It went to Goodwood and had done stuff at Bathurst. But then as I started to have a bit of a look at the mechanicals, you know, I pulled the engine oil out and checked the filter. It was full of metal. The gearbox magnet was full of metal. The diff oil, you know, looked nothing like oil. It looked like metal. So I realized that from a mechanical point of view, this car was in pretty ordinary shape and um, that generated work. And, um, you know, from there, we've been able to work with a lot of other car owners, restoring their cars and then took on some restoration projects ourselves. Um, so most recently, the 93 Bathurst winner, which we finished in time for the 30th anniversary at Bathurst in 2023. And I'm currently working on the 1994 car, which is for another customer, uh, third place VP Commodore, first year of the Chev. And I'm not far from, from you know, kicking that engine into life. I'm just looking at it down in the workshop and, uh, you know, filled it up with water and kind of started finishing off a few of the wiring jobs. And um, yeah, so my, my main job, my nine to five is, is working in Perkins Engineering, but working for yourself and and having that ability to be a bit more flexible allows me to go and do some car racing it allows me to maintain my fitness levels that i would need to be a co-driver it allows me to go and work for channel seven and then i do some work on the family farm during harvest and kind of just pick up work here and there and i got some great advice from from craig baird when i was about i don't know 20 and um he said you know like it's very hard to get one gig in car racing where you, you get $500,000 a year wage, which I've never yeah. had. He said, but it's a bit more realistic to maybe pick up six or seven gigs at 50 to 70,000 and, and you're not that far yeah. off. And then you lose a gig, all of a sudden you still got income. So that's sort of been my mantra for a long time is try and work on opportunities that can generate a bit of income and work smart, not hard, as they say. And it, yeah, <laughs> it all pieces together. But like I said, I've I'm certainly not in the BRW rich list for sport athletes from, <laughs> from my time as a driver, but I'm, I'm obviously proud of what I've achieved and, you know, I'm still going. So the phone keeps ringing, which is always handy. Yeah. So um, I've, got, I've got a few questions off uh, a few of those points there. Um, the next project, uh, have you got something lined up or is, is that a secret at the moment? Uh, I mean, there's projects everywhere, but I'm, I'm just Ooh. trying to really focus on finishing the 94 car at this stage because yep. I've just had a few hiccups with a couple of suppliers and things, and I'm sort of not really in the business of taking on work and kind of upsetting potential customers by, you know, not meeting deadlines and stuff like that. So my focus is finishing the 94 car, which I was hoping would be done before Christmas, um, which is not going to happen, uh, unfortunately. But um, yeah, I mean, I, we're still working quite closely with some other customers up in the central coast of New South Wales who are restoring a couple of Perkins cars. So we're sort of readily assisting them, whether it be information or parts that we manufacture um and, and helping them so there's always things on the go and there's always you know i run an online store so i've got quite a lot of the parts that we sell on a lot of the surplus race car parts are available through perkinsengineering.com.au and then we do a bit of merchandise a few hats and t-shirts and a couple odds and ends that pop up from here and there so that sort of generally keeps me ticking along but yep. yeah i mean there's there's certainly some more projects out there that i've that I could take on, um, not necessarily Perkins cars either. There's, you know, oh, okay. I feel like we've, we've set a really high standard now in, in race car uh, restoration, you know, through transparency, through our YouTube channels and 
you know, a lot of car restorations, a lot of people will just sort of paint them and put the right stickers on them and kind of hide in everything underneath. Whereas yep. we're the 180 degrees, the opposite. I've got nothing to hide. I show everyone what I do and it's generated a lot of interest. And I think a lot of people are, um, are very impressed with the level of detail we go to. And obviously that's generated a bit of work. So yeah, I sort of haven't locked into anything beyond this 94 car. And I just want to make sure that I can sort, sort out um, the car owner <clears throat> of that car who's been very good to me and then we'll, we'll look at the next project sort of after that in, into the into the new year well it's not the kind of thing that you want to be working on multiple cars at the same time um, especially when because you'll do most of the work yourself aren't you that that's correct and we've also and why like the restorations have taken so long like we've we've, we've downsized our shed in the last sort of 12 18 months so We've gone from a thousand square meters down to three hundred and sixty square meters. So, you, you know, the, the then that someone might think, "Oh, what's that matter? It's still a decent shed," which it is. But the problem is, if you get three race cars and pull them all down to body shells, you've got to put all the parts somewhere, and that's yeah. you know, body panels, engines, drive lines, brackets. So it takes a lot of space. So, yeah, I couldn't afford to have sort of one or two cars sprayed across the workshop um because it just becomes a limiting factor and we've got a little bit of road car stuff happening here and we do a bit with wheels and everything like that so yep. whilst the car restorations is a is a big ticket item and a quite a cool thing to have um yeah. it's probably not the ultimate core of the business meaning i've you know I've still got other things that tick me along um but yeah I'm, I'm definitely keen to continue doing some resto stuff in the future i mean obviously the perkins cars are ideal but once they're all restored then you got to kind of open your you know open your box of tools if you like and like i said we've we've had a few people speak to us about doing other cars whether it be a, a wayne gardner coke car or a oh, privateer, yeah. um some privateer walkinshaw cars and, and things like that and we get a lot of people speak about road cars and stuff which i'm not yep. generally focused on getting in the road car space i mean i don't understand how it can work from kind of bit of road worthy and insurance sides of things so sort of steer clear of people that want to run them on the daily whereas race car stuff we can yeah. kind of manage it and it's our it's our it's in our wheelhouse so we'll focus on that yeah. for now cool um back onto the driving uh what's wrong with jack lebrock <laughs> no nothing to be honest um <laughs> you know i had a, had a really good three years at erebus with will brown yeah. and um you know when you start to think about what the next opportunity is and how it could look um, you know, I, I, I think, uh, I really, like I said, really enjoyed my time at Erebus and really enjoyed working with Barry Ryan and those guys. And, um, I've had James Courtney ring me every day since Bathurst to try and get me, <laughs> get me involved in his project. And yeah, I think, um, you know, I think, I think Brody's on top of his game. So he's going to take some yeah. beating, not just internally, but from everyone, um, yes. which then makes it a, a bit tricky in, 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 the, in the same team, but no, I think Jack LeBrock's going to do a good job. Obviously, uh, they're, they're pretty wear, well down the track with with Todd Hazelwood, which is no secret, I don't believe. Um, but, yeah, it was just sort of time to to move on. And, you know, the opportunity yep. with Blanchard Racing popped up. And like I said, I've, I've done five years with, with James. And with, with mm. great success, we sort of know each other's game pretty well. And, uh, yeah, um, I, I also think that – I think the Fords will be pretty competitive next year. Obviously, if you look purely at the results this year – it was pretty one-sided whether you agree with the parody or not i'm not getting into the parody i'm just talking about the <laughs> please, result please don't <laughs> but uh yeah i think if it's going to go anyway i believe the fords mm. you know won't go any worse so um no. to me this this looked like a, a good fun opportunity and 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 um yeah I'm, I'm looking forward to it yeah so was james probably your favorite co-driver over the years or someone else oh yeah look i would say definitely the you know one I've had the most success with. My three supercar yep. podiums came with James. Um, podium at Bathurst, podium at Gold Coast, and a, and a Gold Coast race win. So yep. um, certainly. And, and to be honest, we probably would never have actually stopped driving together if it wasn't for a few factors. Like he went and joined Team Sydney after Walkinshaw, and the yep. Team Sydney thing to me looked like an absolute disaster from the outset. And history will probably prove that my assessment of that was correct. The people running mm. it was just, it was just never going to work, and it lasted one race for James. But yeah. then, the thing why I say we would never have split up was because I actually then went and joined um, Twenty Three Red Racing at Tickford with Will Davison. It's, it's funny I'd totally forgotten about that and wanted yeah. to ask you about yeah yeah. So that so, was from the start of twenty twenty, wasn't it? Correct. 
And mm. out of every team in supercars, which team was going to be affected by COVID was that one because Milwaukee pulled their sponsorship and the team dissolved. Yep. But it got picked up by James Courtney and Boost. So, mm. you know, James and I were very confident we were going to drive together that year. I went down to Tickford and jumped in the car and sorted a few things out for James because he couldn't get down to the workshop because of the COVID restrictions. Oh, yes. Yeah. And then we were both completely blindsided by his sponsor that put someone else mm. in the car. So that was yeah. a very strange feeling, you know. It just seemed like an absolute no-brainer. It would have been our sixth year on the spin. Um, mm. There was no testing back then, but, yeah, sponsor had other ideas. Good luck to them. And, um, <laughs> you know, I ended up without a drive in, I think it was June. And, you know, to be honest... Yeah. If it wasn't for a little bit of advice from my wife, I, I probably would have just called time then because I didn't oh, really, really see the benefit in racing at Bathurst for, you know, 20th position. Um, yep. So, for me, I thought, well, I've lost my ride. There's no decent rides here. I, I might as well just shut it all down, um, yep. such as the consequence of the actions of, you know, James' mm. sponsor. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I decided to do it with Jack Smith at Brad Jones Racing and got to, you know, work with another team and another series mm. of engineers and didn't do too bad lap time wise. And yeah. And then obviously the rest of history got picked up by Erebus and, um, mm. you know, James and Tickford came knocking every year after that, but obviously I was pretty <laughs> committed to Erebus at that point. And, um, Which wasn't a bad decision looking back. Yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong. Uh, you know, 2021, it, it, you find one journalist who would write a good article about Erebus and here <laughs> I was, um, you know, mm. defending, the team and Barry and mm. his choice of drivers. And then, you know, however long it was later, maybe 10 months later, Will Brown's on provisional pole at Bathurst and everyone's like, oh, yeah, we mm. better change what articles we're writing. And it was, you know, it was good to be a part of all that. But, you know, when you've been around as long as me, you, you can see that if the core ingredients are right, results will come. And that's certainly yeah. how Erebus were. Um, yep. You know, good young drivers, good engineers and, and a – and a kind of focus on making sure the cars were fast, and that's what they did, and they proved everyone wrong. Yeah. Um, so, do, so do you see that kind of similar building process with Blanchards now? Because um, they've obviously had their troubles this year, um, but they've they've obviously signed a few key new people expanding into two cars and that. Yeah, I think the the probably the biggest difference is that they haven't been around as long as Erebus. I mean, Erebus mm. started in 2013 with the Mercedes stuff and then moved to Melbourne and went to Holden's and then Barry Ryan become running the show because he was running the GT3 program for Erebus before then. And, you know, I think um, I think it's a slightly different scenario based on the fact that, you know, Blanchard's started from the ground up. They didn't buy mm. someone else's race team. Um, they did it their way. And, you know, they came out swinging their first race at the Bathurst 500. You know, Tim mm. Slade was on the front row of the grid and it was all looking really good. But it probably just hasn't panned out as well with one car and the resources. And they've had they've had their own staffing issues, which they're not hiding behind. Um, mm. It's been difficult to find good people. And, and as it would be, I mean, you mm. know, a one-car team and the only one-car team in pit lane – potentially not the most attractive offer for, for, for staff to be involved in and you're coming from the ground up. But, yeah. I mean, credit that really has to go with with Tim and John Blanchard, their family. Like, their commitment to motor racing in Australia is probably unrecognised. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, they're expanding to two cars. They've gone and bought another wreck so that they can run two cars. It comes at, at, at an expense to themselves in terms of the, the politics of that. But they're committed to it. And... Uh, you know, they've sort of put their money where their mouth is. They've gone and, and got a lot of good people that, that have come over from various race teams. So they've bolstered the engineering ranks. They've got good mechanics. They've got a new team manager. And I think the ingredients are there. The kind of commitment from the owners is there. And mm. it's really up to now everyone to do their jobs and do their jobs well. And, and if you do that, the, the, the success should follow. So... Yeah, I'm keen to be a part of it. They're not going to go out and win the first race. I mean, I hope they do, but um, <laughs> it'll take a little bit of time to get it all to gel. And, uh, yeah, I, I hope that, you know, especially come the Enduros, the live pit lane thing will, will play a big part for, for, for them yeah. because they're going to start the year at last. And that's kind of where people feel as though they sit in the pecking order. But I'm hoping that good results, you know, drag them up 
up pit lane and people start to realise that, that these guys are a force to be reckoned with. And again, for me to be a small contributor to that will, will, will be a nice little feeling. And uh, yeah, I'm just looking forward to playing my role. And I would love nothing more to, to get some successful results for, for Blanchard Racing Team. And uh, I know James is the same. And not forgetting the second car, obviously, young Aaron Love's making his debut. And, um, you know, his father was a Perkins engineering customer way back in the early 90s, and he owned Perkins engineering chassis number 18. So it's uh, cool to work with some familiar names. And, like, I started racing go-karts with Tim together in 1998, and um, <laughs> his um, grandpa worked on my grandpa's race cars as well. So we've got a lot of synergy there and a lot of history, and, yeah, looking forward to, to building on that. Does the um, deal come with an old man caravan or is that something you've got to work out later on? <laughs> if I had a dollar for everyone that's asked me if I've got a caravan in this deal, <laughs> I'd probably be able to go and buy one. <laughs> but uh, no, obviously, Snowy River is a sponsor of the team. I've done my yep. deal with the team, but uh, obviously there'll be some involvement. I've got the hat on. Obviously, there'll yeah. be some involvement with Snowy River and, uh, um, you know, James James Courtney's pretty keen. We're going to – we've got um, – two kids the same basically the same age my son mason's two days younger than james's son kobe so we've oh. chatted about maybe doing a bit of a road trip somewhere and yep. and uh hook up a couple of snowies so i dare say we'll be involved in a snowy at some stage whether i'm an owner <laughs> of one or not i'm not sure but i'll try and work that into a deal at some point <laughs> um on the co-driving stuff what do you take of the forcing the main drivers to start um, the endurance races. Yeah, I, I mean, I can see both sides of the argument from mm. a from a core racer and a and a kind of team point of view. I I, I do disagree with it. Um, it's mm. got a little bit of social socialism attached to it because at the end of the day, if you tell everyone what to do, everyone does the same thing, and then mm. we all do the same stuff, and then the results look the same, and then ultimately the entertainment side of things becomes a bit lackluster. Um, but on the flip side, I can kind of see why a lot of people, you know, especially, and we talk about this a lot on channel seven internally, because we have a lot of casual supercars viewers, people that are channel surfing yep. and they end up watching the racing because it's on TV. Um, so in channel seven land, I think, you know, casual surfers that tune, tune in for the start of Bathurst may get a bit confused why you know mm. dave russell is starting next to jamie wink up and that's a bad example because they're actually both co-drivers but dave russell <laughs> but against, jamie uh, wink up is a, a known name i suppose cor in, in correct but, you sort of see yeah. my point like mm. i can sort of see why they've done it but yeah ultimately the teams have lost a, a big opportunity with their own strategy mm. i think um you know, like I look at Sandown and think maybe that that would be one that they could implement that starting one mm. because unfortunately everyone starts the co-driver, racks <laughs> up the minimum laps, and then the main mm. driver jumps in. So everyone's strategy becomes the same. So that to me would be a better race to say, hey, start the main driver so that the co-drivers play more of an active role in the middle of the race because at the moment mm. the race doesn't start until the main blokes hop, hop in and the start of the race is, you know, like, I, I led 20 laps at Sandown this year, but we finished fourth. So mm. no one's even sit, sort of half pat me on the back from a media point of view because, uh, you know, we didn't figure at the end of the race. But um, mm. I don't know. It's a tricky one. I, I'm just not a fan of this kind of socialism where everyone gets told what to do. And, you know, we're yeah. an entertainment game. We need to remember that we, we need to be doing stuff that entertains the fans. I mean, maybe the fans think that's entertaining having all the same guys start in the car. So I hope it works out. But, you know, there's so many other rules that will make that race better. I mean, having this kind of mandated number of stops, which they finally did get rid of last year. But, yeah. you know, maybe they could work out how to get rid of double stacking. I, I've got a great idea for that. I mean, Bathurst pit lane is long enough where everyone, if you've done away with the pit booms, if you don't mm. have a pit boom, and for Bathurst only, you have a set of rules where everyone can pit in the pit lane together because it's long enough. And then the pit crew just run out with the hoses and change the outside wheels first and then run back to the other side. Mm. Then every car would fit in pit lane at once and you wouldn't have any double stacking and it would look a bit like a NASCAR pit lane. And, um, and you're essentially covered by the fuel at Bathurst as well. 
So it's Correct. not like Correct. you've got people running around while the car's trying to take off. Yeah, and then the first argument you'll get from supercars is, oh, that's going to cost so much more money. Well, no, it won't, yeah. because currently we use six people in a pit stop. So yeah. how about you go back to using three or four, so you yeah. have one that will jack the car up, one that will put the fuel in, and two guys yeah. changing tires. So that's yeah. eight people across. If you've got a two-car team, you've got 16 people there. Yeah. So you've still, just, you've still yeah, got so two from, fuel rigs in that there as well. So... It, it won't it cost it, it, if anything it'll cost you less money because you can leave your pit boom at home <laughs> don't worry about a pit boom and then just mm. like i said have the crew run out like a nascar or a gt3 pit stop and change the rules bathurst only no double stacking and then all of a yeah. sudden you'll go oh yeah this is pretty cool the second car is still capable of winning the race if there's a pit stop with 30 mm. laps to go but anyway that's just my yeah. thoughts yeah, well, it's funny, it was funny. That was one of the big things um, when I did my Bathurst preview. And it was basically like, say, with Triple Eight and Erebus, the predicting who was going to be the top car of the day was basically whoever was in the lead at the start. Because if there was double stacking, then, you know, and the, whoever's second in line just ends up at the back of the queue. Yeah. I and mean, when we, 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 <laughs> We got both ends of that. Like at Sandown, we didn't double stack and Brody mm. and, and Dave did, but they had such good pace. They got back through the yeah. field and passed us on the track. But at Bathurst, it's a lot more, it's a lot trickier and then it you know can happen more times. So we got double stacked two or three times behind car 99 this year, which, I mean, that didn't stop us from winning the race. We Ultimately, we weren't mm. quite fast enough either. But yeah, it'd be nice if that didn't happen and probably nice for the viewers at home because just keeps everyone in the game um in the race a lot more and then um yeah that would be quite entertaining watching a different style of pit stop and yeah like i said mm. the pit lane there's long enough to fit every car in it we i i think it, 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 every time you bring up something like that you get met with negativity how about you meet it with positivity and see if you can make it work because mm. it's a no-brainer to me well the the other thing um my attitude a little bit is give it a go for one year if it doesn't work well we tried it and it didn't work yeah. If it, if it works brilliantly and adds to the entertainment, well, bonus, rather than just kind of being negative and not giving it a go. Yeah. Oh, and look, and I, I agree. That's what I mean. It's um, it's it's something that's you know potentially robbed us of some better great races over the years. Um, you know, I think of the heyday of Lowndes in that sort of Triple Eight yeah. era when he kept having a double stack and. He did come out on top a few times as well, but you know, a lot of people still just talk about the double stack. And yeah, from a TV point of view, it's tricky as well, you know, when you're trying to explain how it all works. And again, you think of the casual viewer and mm -hmm. it's, it's hard to explain, you know, it's, it's just, you just yeah. don't need to have those where, you know, we talk about trying to make it all less technical or we'll just keep it simple, right? As, especially on the biggest day of the year where you've got the most casual fans watching. That's it. Yeah, exactly mm. right. And, you know, we're so lucky to have Bathurst. It's like Melbourne Cup. People that people that don't mm. like racing will watch it. Um, and it's pretty straightforward, you know. It's not mm. like half the jockeys start in the, in, the, in the garage and run out and jump on the horses <laughs> or anything. Like, it's all pretty straightforward. It's a race. Everyone starts on the same line and, and they finish, yeah. you know, and, and that's it. There's no – nothing in between that can kind of, you know, fog the results or upset – passionate supporters <laughs> mm. <laughs> um before, before we get too political on everything um i don't want to hold you up too long um i've just got a few uh quick fire questions to finish up sure. on yeah um no okay uh apple or android uh apple but it's a point of conjecture because dad is <laughs> heavily android for no real reason but the rest of the world appears to be on apple so Group, group oh, message and things has to go through WhatsApp or else you can't send <laughs> photos to Android users. <laughs> I'm, I'm fully on the Android uh, bandwagon, so I'm with him. <laughs> All right. Well, Apple it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, cats or dogs? Uh, probably dogs. We've got neither, but, yeah, cats cats and cat people kind of give me the irrits. <laughs> any, Bro Brody Kostecki and Will Brown are cat people. Ah, okay, okay. I, I, I figured that was aimed at someone. Well, they, um, both, they both sit there and show you photos of their cat. I'm like, looks the same as every other cat. But, you know. <laughs> um, your current daily driver? 
Uh, I've got a new second-hand car this year. I got an Isuzu D Max 2021 out of Warwick in Queensland. Um, so yeah, that's well, it's a second-hand car, but it's new. To a me, nice, so. nice practical vehicle for you. Yeah. Well, before that, I had a 2011 D Max, which lasted yeah 10 years, and that was a ripper. But I was also fortunate when I was at HRT to have a HSV company car and stuff like that. So, oh, nice. um, yeah, no, I'm pretty practical. It's just just a nice little ute. Yep. Got, can put the kids' seats in and we're alive, laughing. <laughs> um, fa- favorite band or artist? Um, that's a good one. I, I really like uh, Rufus. Okay. Um, I sort of like that sort of dance house music, but I also love yep, yep. all the old stuff. So I've I've seen Fleetwood Mac live three times. I love oh, Crowded yeah. House, and yep. I love a bit of everything to be honest. So um, I won't discriminate there. Nice. Um, I think I know the answer to this one. Uh, Bathurst or the Championship? Which one yeah, would Bathurst. you prefer to win? Bathurst. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, are you childhood hero? Uh, yeah, it's a funny one. Like I, I obviously my my dad um mm. but then equally kind of all the people he was racing against when i was a kid i used to re- you know be able to hang out with guys like greg murphy russell engel um yep. uh who else that year i mean mark scaife you've got was, was you've got to popular. drive with most of them yeah yeah that's the that's the funny thing you know when i was a kid i always wanted to race bathurst with dad but it never happened mm. and then when i got to race with murph in new zealand that to me felt you know like one of the coolest things ever and then yep. racing with Russell a few times um, at Bathurst. Again, I couldn't run with Dad, so running with those guys was probably the closest thing to it. So that was pretty neat. Um, what would you class as your best race ever? Well, it's funny. If you ask Dad, he'd say Sandown this year, where, where I led mm. Wink up for a lot of the race. He reckons that's the best drive I've ever done. Mm. But there's been times where I feel like I've been mid-pack and you know, been competitive, yep. dri- driven good, no mistakes. Um, the, the, that no one sing- notices. Yeah, it's hard to single one out. I mean, Bathurst 2019, when we got on the podium, we had to save an enormous amount of fuel all day. So we were chasing slipstreams, and it was a real strategy race. And you know, we were able to push 24 laps out of a tank of fuel when everyone else was 21. And yeah. then people go, oh, "You fluked the podium." It's like, well, hang on, I did 48. <laughs> I did 48 laps in two stints, which no one even give you any credit for. Um, yeah. Obviously, Gold, Gold Coast again when we won. That was a fuel mm. race, but you know, I drove around my stint and made sure I didn't hit any tire yeah. bundles and do things like that. So, um, but the one that got away was Bathurst 2014. We qualified in the shootout, myself and Cam Waters. We yep. were ahead of Wink Up and ahead of Mostert with 25 to go, and we got a drive through penalty for an unsafe pit release, and we had fuel in hand over them. So, mm. what, what, which would have been yeah. handy that day. Oh, yeah. I mean, you can't say we would have won because, I mean, hmm. if my auntie was a boy, she'd be my uncle. But um, <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, it's just one of those ones that you never know. We were ahead of them. We had fuel mileage on them. Who knows? Hmm. Hmm. Um, le- least favourite driver in the field? Uh, in the current field? <laughs> oh, just, just of any time. Who have you had a bigger dust up with? Oh, I used to seem to have run-ins with Jason Barguana all the time. So yep. um, I never never had him on my Christmas card list. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, it's hard, to, it's hard to sort of have anyone. I don't race enough against a lot of the guys now to have any issues. But um, And then I got to interview him on TV, so I kind of try and be friendly <laughs> with all of them. <laughs> so we'll, we'll, we'll save that until later on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll save that to when I don't have to interview anyone. Yeah. Um, do, do you ever Google yourself? Um, yeah, a couple of times I have, and that's only yep. because I'm trying to find that someone will say, how many race starts have you done? I'm like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> so you Google it. Um, yeah. you, you'd be up that, to a hell of a lot now, wouldn't you? Uh, well, it's over 150, but no one gave me mm. the, 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 the cake with 150 candles in it. Like mm. a few of the guys get. So I yeah. don't know. Um, uh, a couple of times I've sort of Googled myself looking for photos, I suppose, for, for a couple of different things. Um, yep, yep. But yeah, I certainly don't sort of Google myself to see if anyone's talking about me. I'm not, I'm not that sort of into it. Not worried. <laughs> nah. <laughs> um, and, and finally, the most important one, uh, pineapple on pizza. Uh, yeah, like I'll, I'll do it. Um, 
purely on just a Hawaiian pizza, but yep. I don't believe it belongs on a pizza. Uh, that's the wrong answer. Well, I, I'll eat it, but yeah, I get I get the argument there. But yeah, it's, I mean, I've seen someone put banana on a pizza, and that I thought that was strange, but it was actually really quite good. So oh, okay. maybe don't don't discount the fruit on a pizza. There, there you go. Wise, <laughs> wise words. <laughs> yeah, well, you never know, right? Yeah, um, give it a go. If it if it works, awesome. If it doesn't, well, don't do it again. That's it. That's it. Mm. Um, and on that note, thank you very much for your time. It's been great chatting with you. Hey, mate, no, no problem at all. It feels like we've just scratched the surface. Um, but no, I appreciate uh, you having me on and you've got a cool little channel here. So um, I'm, I'm looking forward to a little bit of feedback. Yeah. And also, um, if, if you haven't seen, Jack has his own or Perkins Engineering channel uh, where you can follow along with the builds on the cars in the workshop um and yeah there's there's a bit more of stuff with uh larry driving the cars and things like that as well so it is a great channel to check out uh and it goes right in depth with the builds uh, very very interesting yeah that's it per perkins engineering search it on youtube yeah i'll put i'll put a link down in the uh description as well oh, but uh yeah man. thank thank you very much for your time and uh we'll catch you later cheers mate thank you once again, a massive shout out to Jack. Thank you so much for your time. Um, if you haven't already, uh, check out his channel on YouTube, Perkins Engineering. Uh, they follow through the, uh, he's restoring the uh, 1993 Bathurst winner and it's a uh, sister car, the 1994 uh, podium getter there at Bathurst. Uh, the detail they go into uh, restoring these cars, trying to make them as original as possible is amazing. Uh, Larry does play a little bit of a role in these videos as well. Uh, it is mainly Jack going through here that uh, but one of his jobs at the moment is restoring those cars, as we saw in the interview. Uh, also, he is on a podcast, uh, Cab Confessions. Uh, it's on farming and tractoring and things like that, so I haven't bothered listening to it. There's about 12 episodes online, and um, they seem to do it uh, one, once a week. Um, I think they're having a bit of a break over Christmas. Uh, but that's uh, if you're into farming, that's probably one to check out. But once again, uh, thank you very much to Jack for your time. Uh, it was great getting getting to know you a bit. And uh, until next time, I'm still Dave and I'll catch you later.